Welcome to Stanford Data Science's first distinguished lecturer. I'm going to welcome um, to the podium Emmanuel Candice, who is our faculty director in Stanford Data Science. So please uh, welcome Emmanuel. Well, I don't need such a cheer, Francesca does. Uh, well, it's, I've been mingling, and so it's been uh, great to see so many of you. And so we have a very distinguished speaker today. Uh, I'll say a few words about her in a minute. We also have a very distinguished audience. I'm very happy to see so many people braving the weather to come to this event. So this is a first for us. Uh, we are trying to, as you know, data science touches every corner of the university. And we're going to try to have... Uh, a lectureship that sort of connects data science with many, many different schools. And today we're going to talk about health and uh, sustainability and climate change. Um, and so this is a bit of an unusual format for Stanford because we try to have this to be a festive event. And so stay tuned for further events that we're going to announce very soon. Um, I said it's a distinguished audience. I was mingling a bit. I saw high school students, and I'm very delightful to have high school students. I saw Nobel laureates. So we have the entire gamut of, uh, of and that's fantastic to see, and that's what it should be. So today, uh, we're very pleased for this distinguished event to welcome a distinguished speaker, uh, Francesca Dominici from uh, Harvard University. Uh, Francesca is actually... Uh, leading a data science initiative at Harvard University, uh, a bit similar to the ones we're trying, uh, we're having here, and so maybe she'll say a few words about this. Uh, but um, just a few words of introduction about Francesca. Um, she grew up in Italy and she got her degrees, a PhD degree from the University of Padova, which is one of the oldest universities in the world, which happened to celebrate its 800th anniversary. Uh, last year. And for those of you who do not know the wonderful University of Padova, this is a place where Galileo was a professor a long time ago. And so uh, <clears throat> Francesca graduated in statistics in 97 with a PhD in statistics from the University of Padova. And she has made most of her career at Harvard, where she made extremely important contribution to um, the effect of pollution on health. And so I think we're going to hear a little bit about this today, and really the fundamental uh, work on the effect of pollutions on human health. And if you were to look at her webpage, you'd see that in recent years, she actually, at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, also looked at the interaction between uh, the interaction between the COVID virus and uh, the pollution and the effects on health. So she has won numerous awards for uh, her work. Uh, it's going to take me a while to read them all, so I'll just mention the, the most salient ones. I think the uh, two things I want to mention, she's a fellow of the American Statistical Association and of the Institute of Mathematical Statistics. And most notably, in 2018, uh, she was elected to the National Academy of Medicine. And so we're very happy to have uh, Francesca join us for this first lecture. And please uh, join me in welcoming her to the podium. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. It's really an honor and privilege to see you all in 7.30 in the evening. I'm generally watching Netflix, so uh, thank you. And thank you, Manuel, for inviting me to give a lecture, which is 10.30 Eastern time. I'm making sure that we will invite you to give a 4.30 a.m. lecture in Boston <laughs> next year. <laughs> So, um, no, it's wonderful, and it's been a wonderful day. So what I'm going to do is I really hope to keep this extremely informal and interactive. I will tell you what has been my passion in data science for making an impact. And uh, uh, I was so, it was so gratifying to hear that there are even high school students here, and so I really want to make sure you will ask as many questions um, as you can. So I'm going to start with really some background, just some, some very, very basic. And also just to say that air pollution and climate change are really two sides of the same coin. And um, I think this, this slide, is, which is really a cartoon, tells you a little bit about most of the story. And so what, what I'm trying to say, many of you already know this, is that there are uh, several sources of air pollution and also greenhouse gases from traffic pollution, 
cars, fires, um, methane emission. And so they are both sources of air pollution or pollution itself. Some of the air pollutants are greenhouse gases, and we know that greenhouse gases has an impact on climate change. And then climate change can make their pollution worse. So of course, it's 10 times more complicated than what I'm telling you. But the reason why I'm having this slide is that what I want to try to convince you is that by using data science and a lot of data to inform air quality regulation has this added benefit of also controlling climate change and greenhouse gases emissions. So you get two benefits. Number one, we breathe cleaner air, which is really nice. And second of all, we control the same sources of uh, greenhouse gases. So that's one, one I would say, fact. The second thing which I want to tell you about is um, the Cleaner Act. The Cleaner Act is a federal law that it was signed by President Nixon in the 70s. And it's a really important law. It's actually a law that benefits the impact of data science. At that time, they didn't know, but that's, that's exactly what happened. So the Cleaner Act is a comprehensive federal law that authorize EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, to establish the national ambient air quality standards, to protect public health and public welfare, and to regulate emissions of hazardous pollutants. This national ambient air quality standard, they were, we also sometimes call them safety standard, um, are extremely important because what happened is as part of this federal law, the EPA has the mandate to, to look at all of the science that is out there every five years. If the science tells that the safety standard for fine particular matter for other pollutants are not safe enough, so if the science said that people that are breathing level of air pollution below the standard are still sick or getting sick, by law, they have to lower the, the this standard. So it's a perfect law where science informs policy. And fortunately, this is really timely right now. This is a very important time in history because the Biden administration, this is an article in New York Times on January 6, 2023, so a few weeks ago, the Biden administration is moving toward tightening the limits on deadly air, air pollution. In fact, the New York Times said the new rule would, for the first time in decades, reduce emission of soot, which is fine particulate matter that disproportionately harm communities of colors. Now, the other very important piece of the background is you should know that as right now, for the last 10 years, the National Ambient Air Quality Standard and the Safety Standard for fine particulate matter have been of 12 microgram per cubic meter. So that means that what the EPA is assuming is that if you are exposed to annual level of fine particulate matter below 12 microgram per cubic meter, then you are safe. It shouldn't be harmful to human health. If we find evidence that levels of exposure to fine particulate matter below 12 microgram per cubic meter is harmful, then they have to lower the standard. They have already decided, that's really important, they already decided they are going to lower the standard. That's what the New York Times article said. However, they haven't decided how much they're going to lower. They could lower up from 12 to 11, from 12 to 10, from 12 to 9, from 12 to 8. And you can imagine that a lowering from 12 to 8 is going to have a positive impact on public health and a positive impact on regulating greenhouse gases emission that is order of magnitude more, you know, more relevant than just lowering from 12 to 11. Okay, so they are, they're deciding this right now. Historically, the, the Cleaner Act has allowed us to clean the hair. And so this slide show you that this has been a perfect story, I would say, where we had the data provide data science, the data science provide evidence, the evidence lead to policy changes because, again, they review the evidence every five years. And if they found that the current level, of the current standards are, are not safe enough, they lower the standard. 
and then they reviewed the evidence for five years, and they found that, and so the, or, originally the, uh, national, the national ambient air quality standard for fine particulate matter was 40 micrograms per cubic meter, and then they went to 30 micrograms per cubic meter, and then, you know, so, so on. And so you can see that the ambient level of air pollution have been declining over time. That plot shows the level of different air pollutants in the air since the 90s. And then you can see that the skyline are cleaner, right? I'm sure that many of you have been noticing that we have been breathing cleaner air. So this is a perfect, right now we have a perfect window of opportunity to use data and data science to continue to inform regulatory policy, to continue to lower the standards, improve public health, breathe cleaner air, and target greenhouse gases emission. So here is, this is the question, and this is a $3 million question, right? So is exposure to PM 2.5 below the current national ambient air quality standard associated with an increased mortality risk? By the way, if you're putting this question on chat GPT, which I did this morning, <laughs> after I've been spending 24 years of my career in trying to address the question, I am very happy to report that chat GPT got it wrong. So uh, anyway, just want to say that, because I had like a moment of panic. It's like, maybe chat GPT has already figured it out. <laughs> All right, good. Yeah, I just give you something that sounds really good. It's going to tell you that PM 2.5 is very bad for you, that causes more mortality, that gave asthma, it would be good to regulate, but it doesn't address the environmental policy question of tri several trillion dollars that I'm trying to address. So again, this is a question of trillion US dollars. So the Cleaner Act benefits are ranging from 1.9 trillion to 3.8 trillion in 2020 and up to 5 trillion in 2030. And this benefit do not account for the potential co-benefit that we will get thanks to climate change, okay? This doesn't account for the number of lives saved of the extra wildfire that we're gonna prevent and so on, right, all the natural disaster. So how we're trying to address this question? Data, 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 a ton of data first, and then a ton of really important rigorous methodology. So basically, I had this, just this small ambitious uh, goal of trying to analyze the entire healthcare system. And I actually did it. Uh, we have all 100%, 100% of everyone in the United States that is enrolled in the Medicare system. So if you're here, if you're older than 65, and if you're in Medicare, so the bad news, I have your data set, I have your data. The good news, don't worry, I can identify you, so, so relax a little bit. But we do have everyone in Medicare, we know their, um, the age they enter in Medicare, they know the place of residence up to a zip code. We have age, gender, and race. We know whether or not they're eligible also for Medicaid, which is a surrogate for socioeconomic status. We don't have extensive um, information at, at the individual level in terms of additional risk factor, and we can talk about that in the discussion, whether the pros and cons about that. And then we consider all of their, you know, all additional information from the census, from the zip code. Now, in terms of the health history, so we know every single hospitalization they have when they get to the hospital, uh, up to seven diagnostic code where are discharged from the hospital and the date of that. So this entire health history from the moment that they had from an hospitalization viewpoint. Now, you can also purchase uh, what's called Part B data, which are doctor visit, and also Part D data. I'm sure many of you are working with, climate, with uh, claims data, and it's medication. I'm not going to talk about anything of that. I'm just really focusing, actually, this, this talk on mortality data. But you can, you know, analyze it and look at this point. Yes? So I'm going to take your word, and I'm going to interact with you. Here. Yes, please. So do you have uh, geographic mobility? Like, since we're going to try to link mortality with where you live and air pollution, do we know the history of where these people live? Yeah, so we know up to uh, uh, at, at the yearly basis. So if you are in Medicare and then you moved, then you have to change your place of residence. So, so within a year for long-term exposure, so we know. And we can track and figure out where, where they are. Not on an hourly basis, on a daily basis. But if I'm, the over, if, if I'm over the age of 65 and if, when I was 40, I lived in let's say, very polluted Los Angeles, let's say we're in your 80s, do you know this? Do you have this in your database? No. 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 
yeah, that's that's a, yeah, that's that's a very important point. No, I, we don't we don't have that. So um, so that's the health data, and so basically one of the really important element is to build this uh, I call it data data platform, and it's more than a data lakehouse because it's gathering information from all different type of environmental exposure, all different type of health, all different type of socioeconomic status, and try to link it geographically and temporally and align it. So then you could have multiple people interrogating the data. And so just to give you a very high level view, it's basically in three buckets. One bucket is all about environmental exposure. And so I'm only gonna focus on fine particulate matter, but we are gathering data on different pollutants, on wildfire exposure, maintenance suspicion, uh, fracking, exposure to tropical cyclones. And the nice thing about that, you can add the layer of data, right, within the same platform. Then the health data is the Medicare data. We have Medicaid data as well. And you can, get again, you know, there is a Kaiser Permanent. I mean, other additional could be electronic medical record or claims data. And then there are what we call confounders, which are uh, variables that we need to adjust for it because they could be, you know, confounding the relationship between the environmental exposure um, and health. Now, I want to open a small parenthesis about how do we estimate environmental exposure, in this context, exposure to air pollution? And even though I'm gonna talk about specifically fine particulate matter, I think that the data pipeline and the methodology can be applied for all range of environmental and social exposures in this new world of data science. So this map shows where the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, measure pollution every, every day. Okay, so you can see that they monitor it pretty well, but still there are areas in the United States where people don't live near to a, to a monitor, right? And so because we have the Medicare data, we have data available for every single zip code in the United States, you could see that if I was going to rely all your monitoring, monitor data, I would assign air pollution exposure to some people where the near monitor could have been 50 miles away, right? So it's, it would have been not as accurate as we wanted. There is an entire field, and Marshall Burke is it's one of the experts as well, where you can now use a machine learning together with satellite data and together with atmospheric chemistry model to get much better and higher resolution measure of exposure. So this is just like you know one way to do it, and there are many, many ways, and probably better than this. But basically, the idea is that you build machine learning and ensemble learning models, and you take as input, and how you train the model using land, land use term, output of atmospheric chemistry model, you take meteorological variable, and then we can use satellite measurements. For fine particulate matter, we can use aerosol optical depth, which is an imprecise measure of air pollution. And then we train the, the machine learning model using also monitor the PM 2.5 data, and then we get out pretty good validated measures of fine particulate matter a one kilometer, one kilometer grade for all the continental United States. This is just one of probably 50, 80 different type of machine learning model that now are estimating environmental exposure. But the, again, the idea, right? So you could think about how you can do this in different contexts by leveraging everything we know about atmospheric chemistry, supplementing by satellite images, combining with the machine learning model and training on the monitoring network. And I think to me, even though I'm not an expert on this field, this type of work has been revolutionizing the way that we can really understand the linkage within, you know, between environmental exposure, you know, wild, wildfire, for example, and, and mortality or air pollution. So in the context of fine particulate matter, we now have um, very good measures of exposure to fine particulate matter, one kilometer, one kilometer grid, and we can now link to the Medicare data. A small parenthesis I also want to make that uh, not only my team, but many other teams are now, remember the fine particulate matter and air pollution is actually, 
is the combination of many different chemical components. And so you wanted to understand not only whether or not fine particulate matter is harmful, but what are the chemical components of fine particulate matter? And what are the sources? Are mostly the combustion sources? Are mostly natural sources? Uh, and so this is a, just an example of additional refinement where, for example, now we can estimate exposure to elemental carbon at a 50 meter, 50 meter resolution for 20 years for all the continental United States. So you can see these are little screenshot for the different of the, the different part of the, um, the geographical area. Again, this is where the area of machine learning, artificial intelligence, and, and I would say tremendous amount of computing combined with atmospheric chemistry is revolutionize this field because you don't need to use an SSR. You can link now this exposure data to any type of other data that you want. You don't need to do my study on Medicare. If you have electronic medical record or if you're interested to looking at this environmental exposure and how affecting the house prices, right? Or you know, all anything, any question really, these are additional layer of data that, by the way, all of this data now is publicly available. And as more data are provided, that's that's for publicly available. So Let's, let's start now going a little bit into, from the background to the data of how we are trying to tease out the link between exposure to air pollution and Medicare for you know, 70 million Americans. Um, and so let me first just start by doing a very, I will call it traditional statistical analysis, right? Bread and butter, this is bread and butter biostatistics. And so we want to look at exposure to air pollution to time to that. So it's the, the standard way to do it. It's a Cox proportional hazard model. If you don't know what's Cox proportional hazard model, it, it, it don't know what it is. You don't need to know. It's basically the relationship between exposure to air pollution and time to that, adjusted for confounders. And you can make it computationally faster if you use a post sound regression, which is basically the same idea, but then you're looking at exposure, environmental exposure, and risk of that. But this is bread and butter, right? And so we did the bread and butter. We applied, we linked to air pollution data, mortality data, confounder data, and we, in 2017, this was during the Trump administration, as they were this, trying not to lower the, this, the national ambiental quality standard for fine particulate matter. I remember they have to do it by law if you provide evidence that levels below 12 are harmful to human health. So we published this, um, this paper. And you know, it had a huge impact because, basically because the sample size was huge. <laughs> and it, this is, was one of these questions where saying that you are, you are providing evidence of a link between exposure to fine particulate matter and mortality adjusting for confounding for the entire US population older than 65 is really the type of evidence that you need to bring to bear to make a tri trillion dollar question, right? So we had a sample size, we have 60 million individuals, so we, you know, they were followed over time, so it was a 460 million person year. And you can see, if you look at the last column of that table, we have over 32 million individuals that were always breathing level of fine particulate matter below 12 microgram per cubic meter. Always, and I think Emmanuel immediately put a finger on an important point, always since they were in the cohort, right? So they, they could have been a, a breathing other pollution level you know, before that. Um, so this is the data, and by the way, this is also interesting. In 2017, when we tried to run a Cox proportional as our model on 460 million observation, I remember, I, you know, I, this is the, the first time I considered myself an abuse of power because I asked to use an entire Harvard supercomputer for four nights from December 23rd to December 26th. Uh, and it took four days to run to run this analysis, just one run. Now we can run the same model in less than one hour. It's, it's interesting how computationally right, these things change. So standard analysis, and then what we did is, so if you focus only on the first column for a moment, just we did analysis for ozone and so on. And so these are basically the hazard ratios. So basically what we found is 
if you take the old, the old population as a main analysis, um, you have the 10 units increase in fine particulate matter is a 7.3%. That's what 1.073 means. 7.3% increase in mortality risk. If you look at the people that are breathing at levels below 12 micrograms per cubic meter, interesting enough, actually the mortality risk is higher. And this is, this is really interesting. This is a consistent funding with US studies, with Canadian studies, and with European studies. You have that the shape of the exposure response function is actually steeper at a lower level than a higher level. And then if we said, okay, we are not gonna use any machine learning model for estimating the exposure, we're only gonna study the Medicare people that are closer to a monitoring station, and that's the, the analysis based on data from the nearest monitor, we found still a significant, statistical significant effect of 6%. So when we published that paper, it had, it really created a lot of, as you can imagine, a lot of controversy, right? Because uh, the administration at that time really, really, really did not want to touch the national ambiental quality standard. By law, now we are providing strong evidence that the levels below 12 are not safe. And so the easiest thing to do, and this is happening in climate and environmental science, is to try to discredit the work. So this, is, this slide is the good news, where you're famous and the press wants to talk to you, and where Cory Booker is talking about your study, and you know, I say that's one of the wonderful study, and you, know, you're, you are interviewed at NPR, and um, by the way, I, when, when I was interviewed at NPR, I asked my daughter, I said, oh, you know, your mom is NPR. She said, mom, I said, you know, your interview was great, but you're talking about the air pollution and about your hair. Uh, that's because of my accent. I'm sorry, that was a joke. But so in case you haven't figured, I'm not talking about my hair, I'm talking about the air. But anyway, so I, I was feeling very famous for, for a little while. And then there was the pushback of the Trump administration. And, and so, you know, you have a New England Journal of Medicine study saying that the national ambiental quality standards are not safe. And so you really try to get to the jugular of, 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 of the scientists. So Steve, Steve Malloy, he runs a website, it's called junkscience.com. Uh, if you wanna get an interest of how data science can be manipulated, it's a very interesting place to go. They publish this book, Scare, Scare Pollution, Why and How to Fix the Environmental Protection Agency. And then Tony Cox, so Tony Cox is an industry consultant, he was appointed as the chair of the Clean Air Act Advisory Board, Scientific Advisory Board. He is an expert um, in causal inference, and he accused us, so basically junk science had request to federal research misconduct investigation for our pollution study. Uh, so I was accused of, of, uh, of scientific misconduct. The editor of New England Journal of Medicine was at, accused of scientific misconduct. And that's actually true. They, they really did publish on the website this New England Journal of Scientific Misconduct. What was the argument, though? They were really clever. I mean, so uh, I'm sure uh, Guido Inventz is gonna love that. They were saying that they shouldn't trust the things that we did, that the paper in New England Journal of Medicine should be trashed because we didn't do causal inference. And so this is a risk analysis journal. Please notice that the editor in chief of this very prestigious journal is Tony Cox and the paper is by Tony Cox. Um, and so he wrote, um, again, just the last sentence. So uh, basically the abstract said, recent headlines in scientific article projecting significant human health benefits from changing in exposures too often depend on unvalidated subject expert judgments and modeling assumption, especially about the causal interpretation of statistical association. Some of these assessments are demonstrably biased toward false positive and inflated effect estimates. More objective, data-driven methods of causal analysis are available to risk analysis, and this can help to reduce bias and increase the credibility and realism of health effect risk assessment and causal claims. You know, I mean, in a certain way, I don't disagree with that. I mean, you know, we just use some standard methods. It's totally possible that our model were, were wrong. Um, of course, he's, you know, he writes much more with that, but that's became, so because he, he is pushing for causal inference and 
Ultimately, it was post po pushing for causal inference. There's many, many more papers to say, unless you can, um, you know, you can be 100% sure that you're assessing causality, that PM is the cause of death, you cannot make a regulatory decision, right? And we cannot randomize people to breathing pollution, so you can never do a fully randomized study. But on the other hand, I said, well, I mean, we can learn more by using causal inference method. There are very valid causal inference methods. And by the way, this is reached to the National Academy of Medicine. And so there was an entire panel um, chaired by Elizabeth Stewart, which many of you know. I was part as many, as many other people on assessing causality from a multidisciplinary evidence base from the National uh, Ambient Air Quality Standard. So then I said, okay, um, Let's do it in a causal inference way, and let's try to do it the best way that, that we, we can. And so here is another, you know, one-on-one -on -one causal inference for people that, uh, that don't know. There is a fundamental idea of match, uh, matching. I mean, it's a fantastic book of someone here wrote as well, Guido with Don, Don Rubin. But the fundamental idea of matching is actually extremely powerful, and it can be extremely powerful in the context that you have a ton of data like we have. And so again, for the people that don't know, I think the idea is pretty simple. You have two cities, Steubenville, Ohio, which has a lot of air pollution, and Portage, Wisconsin, that has much lower pollution. And you have a bunch of people living, and some people are rich, some are poor, some are educated, some smoke, some don't smoke. And then in Steubenville, Ohio, you, that you, that you, there is a particular individual, let's say Jane, and I know a lot of things about Jane. I know that Jane has a low education status. She is not a smoker. Let's say I know her income. I know her behavior. And a lot of things about Jane. And Jane has been breathing the, the pollution from Steubenville, Ohio, for a very long time. And poor Jane died at 72 years old. Well, how do I assess whether or not the cause was the pollution in Steubenville, Ohio? Well, the way I do it is I'm going to go to the other seed in Portage and I'm going to find all of the twin sisters of Jane. Well, if you have massive amount of data, you can find a lot of women that have very similar age of Jane, very similar behavior, seems, you know, that have been smoking or not smoking, when they have similar socioeconomic status, right? The only difference about this circle of green, green women in Portage is that they've been breathing the, the pollution of Portage. And if on average they have been living up to 82 years old, well, that means that breathing pollution, cleaner pollution, make you live seven years longer, right? So that's really the idea of matching and of the, of, of the counterfactual. And this is a very cartoonish way, but ultimately the, the you know, idea of matching, matching with the propensity score, matching with the generalized propensity score is really based on identifying the counterfactual and try to, to figure it out who is a match group of individuals that have the same characteristics of the person that is exposed to high level pollution except they breathe a different level of air pollution. So that's what we did. So what we did is we developed a new methodology in causal inference, which I'm not gonna go much about here, but the idea was to reanalyze the entire healthcare system in the United States linked with our pollution level and doing it by using an only traditional method, but different methodology for causal inference. And so this is again the same data set we up updated with the more recent year up to 2016 and now is actually up to 2018. Um, again, similar data that I was telling you before, now we are up to 573 million person years uh, linked to uh, exposure data and, uh, and um, um, confounder data. And then exactly, exactly the, the same data that, that, that I showed before, but now is, is more up, up, up to date. And so I just want to restress the importance of, in this context, measure confounding. Again, it, for people that are not familiar, what this plot shows is on left is the level of fine particulate matter, and on the right is the absolute correlation between all of the potential confounders of fine particulate matter. Um, and, you know, this, and so basically how you find the confounders is the fact that all of these covariates are indeed, could be correlated with PM 2.5. So when you do the matching, what you do, you create a new, a new population, and I'll show you later that by matching, you break this correlation between PM 2.5 and all of the other factors that could be associated with PM 2.5. 
So we analyzed the data, not only using the standard vanilla Cox proportional hazard model, but we had developed a new methodology, which I'll tell you later, on exact matching on the generalized propensity score, and then we're using some additional methods for causal inference, you know, very well established in, uh, in inverse weighting, very established mat matching method where you include the generally propensity score into the model. And then this is a, what they, we call the balance plot, and so you can see on the left, the red dot is the, the correlation between the potential confounders and PM 2.5 when we don't match, and then the green dot is the correlation that you get after you have done the matching. And you see that because the correlation is all less than 0.1, in this new matched population, you are basically breaking down the correlation between the potential confounder and, and PM 2.5. And so here are, are the, the, the results. So here the, um, the, the, more, the hazard ratio for PM 2.5 are both when you're using a standard regression model and when you're using the causal inference model. And you can see that pretty much they're all very similar. Interesting enough, when you look at the mortality increase when for increasing PM 2.5 about level below 12 microgram per cubic meter, which are the blue dots, you see that there are higher effect estimates, actually, as I told you before. And it is true that the methods for causal inference are finding an, the, a, a, a you know, less strong relationship, but it's really still extremely positive and statistically significant. And that is actually you know, part of the methodology that we have developed is to, to estimate an entire exposure response function that has a causal interpretation. And you can see that is really the entire exposure response function. And you see indeed from the shape of the exposure response function that there is a leveling off at the higher level. Remember, the current standard now is 12 microgram per cubic meter. And you can see that there is even a steeper slope at uh, you know, a level below seven or, you know, or, or below six. So I wanted to take a little break from this and tell you about also the issue of environmental justice, and you will see how these, these two things are, are, are going together, which we all started to pay even more attention as a result of, of COVID. This was work where was entirely data visualization and data descriptive. There is nothing else. But I thought it was powerful enough. Uh, Sometimes it's really important for data science to have, I feel very strong to have the data try to speak by themselves, for themselves, right? And what this is show on, on the left is a plot where this is a, the annual average of fine particulate matter. And you can see that the, the red is at the level of fine particulate matter for the black American. And the green, just if you want to focus for a moment on black and, and, and green, uh, are for the white. And also, so you see that bottom line, black and Hispanic are consistently breeding higher level of fine particulate matter than um, white and Native American. Concerning also to me is the plot on the right that shows that if you look for a moment at the green, uh, at the green curve, you see that as the zip code becomes predominantly more and more white, the level of fine particulate matter goes down a little bit. Do you see in the green light? In the red, in the red line, which is for black, and also for Hispanic, as the zip code becomes predominantly more and more black, more and more Hispanic, the level of pollution is going up a little bit. So there is another way to visualize it, and I'm just, this is again, very, very simple visualization. This is a story I already told you that the level of fine particulate matter been going down. Top is the level of pollution in 2000. Bottom is the level of pollution in 2016, and you can see it's more green, right? In general, be breathing clean hair. But I wanna spend a little bit time on this data visualization, and I, I really worked on it for, for very long time. So, let me walk you through this because I thought it's, it's pretty interesting and very concerning in my viewpoint. So if, let's, let's focus for a moment on only looking at the map on the left. The map on the left is level of fine particulate matter in 2010. And I'm only coloring the zip code that have a level of fine particulate matter above eight. So that, you know, the, the, I'm not saying has a high, high pollution, but they are like higher than average pollution. Okay, so in 2010, you see that all part of the East Coast and, you know, you're welcome, California, 
has you know, high level of pollution. Now, if you look at the color of the, of the dots, the blue area, and you will see it's you know, straightforward, are the area where you have a higher than average black population. Okay? So if you look at the map in 2010, there are two things you can see, naked eyes. This is just plotting the data. Number one is more, more or less half of, half of, the, of the US population in 2010 breeds pollution level higher than eight. And then among the people that breed pollution level higher than eight, more or less 50-50 are blue dots, right? Which are where there is higher than average percentage of black population in that zip code, in that zip code, right? Now let's look at 20, 2016, and by the way, if we look at 2020, it gets even worse. So in 2016, now let's look at the map on the right. So there is a good news and a bad news. The good news, which I already told you 10, 10 times, which is pollution has been going down. So we see smaller number of zip code that are above eight, right? The smaller number of colored zip code because pollution, because hair is cleaner. However, among the polluted zip code, the only one they are remaining are the one where there is higher percentage or higher than average percentage of black American. Only the blue dots, right? In, in 2010, the white dots and the blue dots were equally splitting the high burden of pollution. In 2016, the, the only polluted area are the ones that were our, that are marginalized population. So what this is telling you, just naked eyes, like nothing else, I'm not doing anything else here, is that even though we are lowering the national ambient air quality standard and we are lowering the level of pollution in the air, we are not benefiting the different population equally, right? And in fact, then we do statistical analysis. I'm not gonna tell you much more what's behind this, but bottom line is they, as the enforcement and as the threshold for the national ambient air quality standard becomes more stringent, the environmental inequities become bigger. And that's extremely important for the new law that's been, this, that's been the, uh, defined at the end of the month because they want to do, and they need to do two things simultaneously. They need to regulate their pollution but also making sure that there is environmental justice. And right now, they haven't paid any attention to environmental justice at all. They're just trying to lower the, the standard. And so this is becoming really important in, at the time of the COVID pandemics because we saw also, and this is where, this, is, this type of research is why led me to look at the link between air pollution and COVID. Because by studying pollution for many years and understanding the environmental injustice, when I start to seeing that Afro-American were um, in, in marginalized population were suffering for COVID even more, that's where I start thinking that maybe, maybe, maybe there is a link for, with, with our pollution. And indeed, we did publish the first ever national study that showed uh, and using is all of the data that I showed you before. And that's why having a huge data platform is more important because then we had all of the data already collected and that we were able to assess a link with long-term exposure to air pollution and, uh, um, and COVID-19. Um, and so that, that's the paper. And now uh, a recent literature review, there are over, I would say, 250 papers around the world. Um, and this is actually a very nice data, data science interface where you can see in all around the world how people have been able to identify a link between air pollution and COVID and the different statistical methodology and how you, uh, you combine the data. And closing the loop again with, uh, with greenhouse gases, so this work in this paper, we really calculate the number, of, the percentage of COVID-19 mortality that was attributable to air pollution and specifically to fossil fuel related emissions. So in Europe, we have a 13%, uh, in North America, a 14%, and um, also not, not surprising, so not North America, uh, 13%, and South Asia, Southeast Asia, 15%. So all of this goes into going back to trying 
to provide the type of evidence that the EPA needed. And in fact, after we published the several uh, COVID-19 studies, the EPA recognized that it said there is a sentence here, in addition, a number of recent studies have examined the relationship between COVID-19 and air pollutants, including PM and potential implication. So what's happening now? Now when they decided, I show you at the beginning, the New York Times article at the beginning of this month, and so we're there now again, they're saying, okay, the Biden administration said, we're gonna lower it. Are we gonna lower it to, from 12 to 10, to nine, to eight? And, and the, this is the table they use on the regulatory impact analysis. And you see the second, so they use a study by Paul Padol and um, he did a study on air pollution and mortality for adult. They use our paper, they use the causal inference methodology after responding to Cox, the word all for the elderly. And then they have a study by Bodrof et al to support the evidence for, um, for children. But this is, this is it. This is the only evidence they have right now to make, to make that decision. And so how we're trying to help right now uh, is to really address simultaneously not only lowering whether or not people that are breathing level below 12 are still experiencing adverse health effect, but how you lower the national ambient air quality standard at the same time by looking at marginalized population as well to address an environmental justice. And the EPA right now doesn't have any information about it. And so this is work that we hope to be publishing soon where basically all of the statistical methodology, everything they've been talking about, we, have, we redid it and try to assess the health benefit. This, this bar showed the mortality benefit where you are going from 12 to 10 micrograms per cubic meter, 12 to 10, 12 to 9, or 12 to 8, separately for black American and white American, separately for black American that are um, lower socioeconomic status, so, uh, white, um, black and white American that are higher socioeconomic status. So you can see bottom line is because of the Clearly, lower you put the standard, higher the health benefit, but you can see that because the green bar tends to be higher than the orange bar, stricter the standard, more benefit for the marginalized, uh, for the marginalized community. I'm gonna wrap up. Uh, first to say that I basically skip over all of the <laughs> unresolved data science and the methodology element. So first of all, there is so much more work that needs to be done. And this is like career of many people. First of all, just give you, I'm just gonna give you some highlights. Uncertainty quantification and propagation. So some of these are pollution Exposure, as I mentioned to you, are estimated from machine learning models, so they're not perfect. And so you need to propagate the uncertainty. And there are many other sorts of uncertainty that we need to propagate. So right now, we have an account. I mean, we're doing work that try to propagate the uncertainty, but it's not ready. Causality is great, but even what we, we did is by far from perfect. I mean, you know, you can do matching. Matching is phenomenal, but there's still issues on measure confounding. Uh, sure, I mean, we use a lot of covariate, so the measure confounder will need to be something that is, that is correlated with pollution and is uncorrelated with everything else measured, but still, there's definitely a possibility. We have estimated an exposure response score, but that has a causal interpretation, but clearly there is something more. There is a, this entire field, which I know here at Stanford, they are experts about heterogeneity of causal effect. And so how you, you know, there is a tremendous amount of literature of heterogeneity of causal effect. You can imagine the different subpopulation have heterogeneous effect. I show you a slide about that. Um, but clearly, clearly there is something to do better. And then we also strive to be as transparent as reproducible. So I wanted to acknowledge just like three of the many methodological paper and more data science and machine learning paper in terms of thinking machine learning approaches to really assess the health benefit of the Clean Air Act Amendment. How do we deal with the multivariate uh, high dimensional outcome? I just talked to you about mortality, but clearly we can look at any, con any condition. And then, and again, work on how you, you do matching in, in presence of a continuous exposure um, that um, you know, does exact matching with respect to the propensity score. I just want to acknowledge a lot of people. This is a huge team. Uh, first of all, um, again, because of the huge policy relevance of this work, 
It's re re reproducibility and transparency is really paramount for us. And if it's that's lead to criticism and attack, they are welcome. Uh, but I do think that we always strive to be as open source as possible. Um, and so this is really, it's a now it's becoming a consortium. There are 25 principal investigators from other institutions that are interested in working on this data. Look at wildfire and, and, and health outcome, heat, um, tropical cyclone, methane emission, uh, power outage. So anything that, you know, a lot of different environmental exposure, really important for postdoctoral fellows, PhD student, master student, and undergraduate. And so just want to acknowledge a lot of my uh, colleagues, you know, only from, from Harvard, by Yale, Columbia, BU, uh, and a lot of students that have been really working tireless um, in all of this. So I'm just going to wrap up, and then I really want to have a conversation and question. So the steps needed to mitigate climate change in the future are really substantially the same, and those needed to reduce the burden of death and disability due to air pollution in the present, which is to cut back on burning fossil fuel and biomass. And in the meantime, I hope I got at least some sense that machine learning and data science can have a huge impact in society. Um, and, um, and I think that the impact can only grow over time. And I haven't talked about that, but we'll also allow to measure and pinpoint susceptibility and vul vulnerability. Methods for causal inference, which are now really widely used, I think, uh, widely used, they're also widely used, but it's our, um, you know, really, I would say, bore more opportunity for methodological development, but also to do really important policy work. So, as I said for all of this, I think that developing research as a platform is really important, allowed us to really inform policy at the time of COVID, because we had a template and all of the data ready to respond quickly to, to emergency. And it's, you know, and that's what provided the opportunity to link spatial temporal data, meteorology, climate, air pollution, and many other things. And importantly, to always think about the marginalized population. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions you might have. I was wondering if you also have the pollution data at a very fine time scale. Kind of, do you have that monthly or, or weekly? Or, nah? And could you do something with that? Obviously, you're not going to see a lot of effects on mortality kind of from short-term changes, but maybe you see effects on hospitalization or, or claims or whatever things you can, you can measure in the, the Medicaid data. And could you use those as as surrogates kind of to build models for, for the effect on, on mortality. Yeah, no, absolutely. So what I talked about today is really a, one bucket of work, which is looking at informing specifically the long-term standard, right? So, so the EPA regulates both annual standard, which right now is 12 micrograms per cubic meter, but also they regulate the daily standard, which is 35 micrograms per cubic meter. So, so there is a parallel amount of work that have been involved for many years, which is looking at the daily variation. And so there you have all another, you know, long opportunity. So, so we have both multi-site time series studies, difference and differences. We call it like case crossover, which is a way of matching. Uh, as well as lag to fact, right? So there is all another field, parallel field, a parallel amount of work. And by the way, we found strong effect or short-term effect on mortality, a level below 35 microgram per cubic meter. Um, and so, yes, so in the same way, everything I presented, and I presented more from, I would say, a time to event cross-sectional type, you can do it by actually thinking about, because ultimately, really, what this data entail, that you have a zip code level time series data for every pollutant, for all of the meteorological variable, and for any hospitalization or, or mortality rate, which you can stratify by age and race data. So it's, you know, so, and that's what I mean. It's like, you know, limited amount of things you can look at.
microphone coming. Yeah, Professor, thanks so much for coming, and I really enjoyed your talk. Um, I was curious about uh, data sets, and for your particular paper, you drew from the 65 and above uh, age range, which is, of course, very relevant, but let's not forget that, well, I mean, I was just thinking to myself, <laughs> of course, it's an excellent paper, right? <laughs> New England Journal of Medicine, you know, unbeatable, but um, I was thinking about, you know, this, the, the, uh, super fun, the idea of a Superfund site the program was invented under the Carter administration in 1980, so that was only 20, sorry, excuse me, uh, 43 years ago. So that's younger than many of these 65-year-old uh, uh, people. So with your expertise, can you tell me, do you think it's relevant if we perhaps like find a younger database of people? Oh, absolutely. Thank yeah, you. I mean, you know, again, I, th I think um, we had, I mean, we, when, when we started this, this mission in 2017, again, we had laser focus objective, which is to make sure that when it was coming the new administration, the Biden administration, they had enough evidence to lower the 12 as much as possible. And to do that, the only national database is Medicare because Unfortunately, the U.S., we don't have a, a national health system for everybody. Having said so, of course, you, you want to look at people younger, and many people have done it, and we have done it. So what are the other sources of data they have? And so also remember that there are a lot of really wonderful, very well-designed cohort studies that follow in cohort over time, right? And, and so they have their own advantage. The, the idea here is really try to capture as much as the population. But for example, Medicaid is, an, it's, I think, another really interesting opportunity because Medicaid is, um, it's capture all ages, but it's for people eligible in Medicaid, right? So you can do a study that look at all ages, but lower in Medicaid. And then there are many, many other data sources. I mean, so you can look at um, health insurance data, and but then you have to wonder a little bit about the, the level of representativeness because it depends on who is using that particular health insurance. So you can do more local study, right? So, so absolutely, I mean, you know, it's not that you have to look all the old five, but we were really wanted to keep putting the pressure on analyzing as many people as possible in the US just because even from statistical viewpoint doesn't make sense because if you have enough nationally representative data set, you don't need to count everybody. But from a policy perspective, when if you see a video of Senator Cory Booker cross-examine a someone at the Environmental Protection Agency could try to discredit the study for a policymaker and from a politician to be able to say in the study they include 68 million is very powerful, right? Even if you don't need that, because even if you have two million as national representative, we know what to do with that. But it doesn't matter in that context. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you so much for a wonderful talk. Um, so my question is, what do you think are the biggest opportunities for applying advances in methods and data sets to research questions in adaptation to climate change? Oh, <laughs> I mean, so by adaptation, you mean individual adaptation, or you mean? Um, uh, we're, we're, however you want to define it. OK, so I can tell you, for example, that one way that I've been very interested um, in some type of research I've done is to look at the relationship, for example, of exposure to heat and health. And what you see, actually this is a study we did a long time ago, it would be interesting to, re to redo it now with that there is a much better methodology. If you're trying to estimate the exposure response relationship between exposure to temperature, let's say for a moment, exposure for, to temperature and mortality, you have a U shape, right? Because very low temperature and very high temperature are more harmful. However, what happened is, let me see if I get this right, what, what happened is they, uh, yes, the slope, a lower level, is much steeper in Palo Alto than is in Boston. Because when is, like today, 40 degrees 
in, in Palo Alto, everybody's like, oh, yeah, cold, and they're not adapting. It actually has a more adverse health effect than 40 degree in Boston, right? And similarly, like 101 Fahrenheit in Boston give, you know, you have a higher level of, you know, higher mortality risk than if you have it in Arizona, right? So, so what, what I'm trying to say is that it is a way to look over time, and over time, we know, for example, that the first heat waves always tend to be the most deadly than the later heat waves. So th that's one element that I think we need to do much, 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 much more. There is also an interesting thing that we're looking with this data on heat wave alerts. And so actually that's his decision, decision policy problem. So as we all know, right, you hear from the news that there is a heat alert, right? And so we start looking at and say, well, okay, do these heat alert work? If you hear here the alert, so do, you know, if you take two days, they have a very small, very um, similar temperature, classical regression discontinuity design. But one day, you know, one day is under the one, and one day is under 1.2, and the under 1.2, there is a heat alert, right? Do you see that it has an effect? And actually, the evidence is very weak, the heat alert work. However, then you start asking the question, how many more heat alert you need to issue, and at which temperatures then you have a benefit. So this is the type of, I don't know if I'm addressing your question, but this is the type of things, right, that you can now, when you have this giant data platform, can, can look. And, and, and so how people adapt, because the other problem is you cannot give too many heat alerts, because then people will start ignoring it, right? So that, that's, that's, that's the type of thing, so that I think there needs more work and we can do, which can be extremely effective. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, and I particularly appreciated your early slide where you showed the flow from gathering data to analysis to communication and, and influence on policy. I wonder if you could give us a little bit of your insight as to, that seems to have worked quite well in, in this case. And uh, admittedly that you have the advantage of a very specific legal framework. But of course there are many, many problems where data science is, is trying desperately to find out what we need to do for the future of, of everything. What's your thought your, about what was most successful in your experience and for more difficult situations where one needs to convince not only uh, the particular application of a law, but maybe general public opinion and, and policy? What, what, what would you think uh, are lessons that you feel you've learned in the best way to go about that? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I mean, I've been, you know, I, I realized very, very early in my, you know, in, in my career, my interest that the Clean Air Act was the perfect platform for having an impact in policy. And I've always been interested in data science methodology and work that, where I could see how the rigorous work would have an impact in policy. And so, you know, because then, you know, as you're trying to change and address important questions, there's going to be always criticism along the way. And, but, it, but you can overcome that if you see what type of evidence they need and you have the right data, right? So I think a few lessons. One lesson is that I, I, I always tried and I still try to first understand the law so that, not that I'm a lawyer in any way, but try to understand what type of evidence do I need to produce so then there is a change. Because you can have the best data in the world, you can have the best methodology, but if you're providing, if you're addressing the wrong question, even if it's an important question, but it's not the question they need to have to change the policy, then you're, you're not gonna impact the change. Then there is, a, there is the element of being resilient to criticism and attack that can go personal too. And um, you know, you learn that with experience, the first time you cry, single time you cry, the third time you don't care anymore, you just keep going. <laughs> um, you know, including you know, getting the call that, you know, from the Harvard Press that I've been accused of misconduct because I published a paper in the Indian Journal. That's always pretty scary. Uh, then the other thing which I learned during COVID, 
the, was really to, to listen to policymakers and to work actually to really, so they, the work on environmental injustice actually happened through Cory Booker office. So Cory Booker's office called, called my lab and because they knew that paper and they said, you know, we're really worried about environmental justice. We are trying to develop this new bill with Kamala Harris to, to address issues of environmental injustice. You know, in that paper, you show that you have higher mortality rate for, for black Americans. I think that's what's happening. And we had an entire, you know, my team and his office having several calls and work together to figure out what type of data and evidence they needed to have for the bill to pass. And that's where we published the paper in Nature, which is a data visualization. So he told us, we don't want any fancy, I don't want any statistics, I want to show them two maps, right? And we work with them, the maps I show you with the blue and white dots, I work with them so he could tell us what he wanted to see from the data to have the bill pass. So that's, I think we really have to engage on that and be, you know, do I want to spend six months developing or three years of new methodology or I wanted to make sure he has the information he needs to pass the bill and I decided to go that way. Thank you for your lecture. Um, thank you very much. Um, my question was around the privacy issues I think you touched on um, with the data collection methods. Um, I'm interested in how, how, what was the process of obtaining the, meth, uh, the data for uh, through the, uh, for the Medicare, and how, any privacy issues that ar arose during Yeah, that. I mean, it's, it's, you know, that's one other thing. It's like, it's painful. I mean, you've, you, it's, it's not exciting. It's not, you know, you fill a form, you send a form, you write a check, you send a check, you send 10 emails, they send you a tape, you upload the pay tape, it's in SAS. Maybe some of you don't even know what SAS is. And that's what it is. It's just, you know, every year they have a new, a new, new claims and you buy it. And then what you have to do, you have to sign what's called the data user agreement. And so there are several policy regulations within my lab and in collaboration with other lab that clearly, you know, you have to analyze the data in a private computer, you can impose, blah, 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 right? So, but it's, 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 not particularly interesting and fun, but has to be that way because the data can be identified, identified because it's a zip, a zip, zip code of residence. But you know, the, the type of visualization that will not be subject to, to, you know, to, to, to privacy issues. But that's, I mean, that's another thing with data science, right? That you cannot wait the moment where you can start feeding this super fancy machine learning model in 480 million observation. Well, you know, I have to tell you something. Before you get there, it's a very boring work, right? Uh, but when you have it, then you have the Cadillac data to change the world. And if you start throwing machine learning model to crappy data, you know what you're gonna get out, you know, not something really good. So it's as everything, right? It's it really, there is a, that part of the data pipeline, whatever, and that's true for whatever data, whether it's claims data, electronic medical record data, you know, any of data, there is the, the, the level of attention of doing this needy greedy work that needs to be done and it needs to be reproduced, re, needs to be made reproducible. Because the other thing happened, guess what? There are gonna be mistakes. Right, so then you publish the paper and then you wake up in the middle of the night and said, oh my God, you know, we did such and such. So you have to go back to your entire data pipeline to, to fix it. And that's, that's the real life of data science, in my opinion. Yeah, Thank ahead. you so much for speaking with us uh, tonight. Um, my question is about um, whether there are other studies similar to this one, especially in terms of scale in, ter in other countries where cohorts could go younger for um, public health systems. Are there other countries with like similar um, levels of regulations of particulates um, that could be used like as a comparison with the older cohorts that unfortunately yeah. the only available Great. data in the U.S.? Yes, yes, yes. This has been a phenomenal, uh, phenomenal experience for me. So when I started this, this study, actually a, a funding agency in Boston is called the Health Effect Institute. There have been three studies, three like nationwide studies. 
So I've been contacting the one in the US, and then there is one in Europe that uh, is, I don't remember how many European countries, but many, and they have all age groups. And then there is one in Canada as well. So three different countries, three different teams, different age groups, and interesting enough, and um, yeah, if you, if you like Google uh, low levels of fine particulate matter and mortality in Canada or in Europe, the studies will pop up. And, but the interesting thing that we actually also did an harmonized analysis where we brought all of the data together and the, the, the results are enormously consistent across the three counties, including not only the levels of lower, a low, a low level below 20, 12 micrograms per cubic meter harmful, but also the, the results of the steeper slope at low level. So it's, yeah, it's been really interesting. And you know, their study design is slightly different. They have a more individual level data that we have. The way they're estimating exposure is slightly different. So in a certain way, it's also interesting that there's different data sources, partially overlapping methodology, but very consistent results. And of course, so there are many more studies, you know, popping up in other countries as well. But these three were designed at the beginning, so then we will really compare the results. Okay, and our last bonus question. Yes. <laughs> thank you for the opportunity to ask the question, and thank you for the lecture. Uh, and I know you're not a lawyer, but do you know why the air quality standard seems to focus so much on mortality, which is a really extreme health outcome? Like, if we're trying to promote public health, should morbidity be considered as well? Yeah, no, it's a great question. So the, the, the reason why, so first of all, in the regulatory impact assessment, which is the document they use to ultimately make the decision, they're not only looking at mortality, they're also looking at morbidity. But the reason why they focus on mortality is because that's where you have the largest benefit in terms of monetary benefit because clearly they, you know, losing a life has much higher, you know, cost than, than, than morbidity. So when they do the cost of benefit analysis, right, they focus on mortality as the outcome because it's the most serious outcome. For, again, that's really for the policy, but for public health, absolutely. I mean, we need to look at, you know, many, many other outcomes. And by the way, now there is a very, new area of research where consistent evidence about the adverse health effect on cognitive outcome and, and depression and Alzheimer and so, yes. But they, they focus on mortality because of the cost benefit element. All right, so I would like to uh, offer a round of applause to uh... <laughs> and uh, thank Francesca for a wonderful evening with us. And I thank you again for all coming. One thing I forgot to say about Francesca, uh, well, she has a deep sense of humor, as you could see. No, really uh, but uh, also, uh, one thing that I did not mention before is that she's passionate about helping women uh, in the sciences. And so she has won numerous awards, actually, for promoting uh, women in, in the sciences and the health sciences, especially. And so it's been an honor and a privilege to have you with us. What a wonderful kickoff it is for this series, and we wish you all a, a good night, and uh, we hope to see you again at future events. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>